Man has long sought to understand the universe. Why do we fall to earth? Why does water flow but rocks stay steady? We have always sought answers to these questions, and the stars are not exempt from our ponderance. For thousands of years, people tried to explain the stars and planets. To explain the movements of the stars and planets, a 16th century Polish astronomer, Mikolaj Kopernik, created a theory called heliocentrism. Kopernik explained it in his book on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres, published just before his death in 1543. Because of his book, he is commonly known by his Latinized name, Nicholas Copernicus. On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres is considered the first book on modern astronomy. The main premises of his theory of heliocentrism include, There is no one center of the celestial spheres, which are the spheres in which the movements of the stars and planets exist. The Earth is the center of only the lunar sphere. The sun and planets do not revolve around the Earth. The sun is near the center of the universe as the spheres revolve around it. The stars are in a fixed sphere called the firmament, which does not move. And the earth has more than one motion. Besides orbiting the sun, it also rotates around an axis. Copernicus did not live to see the controversial turning point his theory would create. Though heliocentrism would eventually be supported and widely accepted, it was completely contradictory to the accepted view of the time, called geocentrism. Geocentrism was originally proposed in the 6th century BC and quickly became widely accepted. It is also known as the Ptolemaic system, proposed by Egyptian astronomer Ptolemy. It stated that each of the heavenly bodies revolved in a central orbit, then smaller orbits called epicycles. It stated that the Earth was the center sphere, with the other bodies revolving around it. The stars were set in a much greater sphere surrounding the Earth. Simple observation seems to support this theory. It even supported the scriptures of the Catholic Church, adding weight to the theory. According to the Bible, Joshua chapter 10 verse 13 states, Son, stand thou still at Gibeon. And the sun stood still. When Copernicus's idea that the earth moved around the sun was published, his theories were deemed heretical, as they seemed to contradict Bible passages such as those in Joshua. Bans were placed on his book advocating heliocentrism. As other scientists studied Copernicus's theories and advocated for heliocentrism, they would be deemed heretics. One such astronomer was Johannes Kepler, who delighted in the Copernican system of heliocentrism. He wrote the first outspoken defense of the heliocentric system, titling it Mysterium Cosmographicum. He later published a more influential work, Epitome Astronomiae. It discussed all of heliocentric astronomy in great detail. He also created the first, albeit inaccurate, physical model of the solar system. Perhaps the most well-known supporter of Copernicanism is Galileo Galilei. In the 17th century, he invented the telescope and used it to support Copernicus's theory. He stated that he saw phases on Venus and moons orbiting Jupiter, which disproved the idea of geocentrism. To the Catholic Church, this idea was extremely heretical because it contradicted the theory of geocentrism which was taught by the Church. In April 1633, Galileo was brought before the papal inquisition. There he was tried for heresy, where the church presented letters written to and from Kepler. Said Galileo in one of these letters, Like you, I accepted the Copernican position several years ago, and discovered from thence the causes of many natural effects which are doubtless inexplicable by the current theories. I have written up many of my reasons and refutations on the subject, but I have not dared until now to bring them into the open, being warned by the fortunes of Copernicus himself who procured immortal fame among a few, but stepped down among the great crowd. Kepler wrote as a response, But after a tremendous task has been begun in our time, first by Copernicus and then by very many learned mathematicians, would it not be better to pull the wagon to its goal by our joint efforts, now that we have got it under way, and gradually with powerful voices to shout down the common herd, which really does not weigh the arguments very carefully? At his trial, Galileo offered to publish a second book renouncing Copernicanism. However, this offer was refused. Galileo agreed to plead guilty to a lesser charge. He was convicted and sentenced to house arrest indefinitely. A contemporary of Copernicus, René Descartes, wrote a book titled The World. It explained, among other things, his views on heliocentrism. However, he delayed publication of his book when he heard of the Roman Inquisition's conviction of Galileo. In a letter to Marin Mersen, a famous mathematician, he states, I almost decided to burn all my papers, or at least to let no one see them. The assertion that the Earth moves, 
is so closely interwoven in every part of my treatise that I could not remove it without rendering the whole work defective. Copernicus's theory was also used by Sir Isaac Newton, who is famous for his laws of motion, collectively called Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica. Copernicus had explained that the planets move around the sun. Newton explained why the planets move around the sun. They are held there by gravity. By combining his theory of gravity and his laws of motion with Copernicus's theories, we are able to learn more about the physics of our universe, both the movement of objects on the Earth and in space. It was these theories that allow us to build bridges, cars, and airplanes to travel on Earth, and rockets to travel into space, to the Moon, and to Mars. Our modern machines, communications, even the way we live would not exist. We would not be as technologically advanced as we are today. Copernicus created a model of the movements of the stars and planets. It was this model that enabled men of the 16th and 17th centuries to build sextants and astrolabes, which used the movements of stars to navigate the ocean, allowing sailors to leave sight of land. Those same principles would continue to be used to explore space in the 20th century. Eventually, the Catholic Church's opposition started to fade as more and more scientists supported Copernicus's theories. In 1742, two Catholic mathematicians published an annotated copy of Newton's Principia, including a preface that the work relied heavily on heliocentrism, as presented by Copernicus. The ban on heliocentric books based on Copernicus's ideas was lifted in 1758. However, it wouldn't be until 1822 that printing of these books would be allowed. For hundreds of years, astronomy had been dominated by the doctrines of Ptolemy and the beliefs of the Catholic Church, and technology and our understanding of the stars had stagnated because of it. The Catholic Church held more sway than science. Man was set at the center of the universe which corresponded with the idea that God had given man power over the earth. Copernicus's theories prompted new ideas which exponentially increased the rate of discovery and quest for knowledge in the scientific community. Copernicus's theories have been supported since the 17th century. Many branches of physical science and mathematics, such as the physics of astronomy and calculus, rely on the discoveries that Copernicus made in the 16th century. His work was a turning point and the beginning of the scientific revolution. The theories of many scientists, such as Kepler, who created the first working model of the solar system, Galileo, who created the telescope and discovered planets and moons, and Sir Isaac Newton's laws of gravity rely on the theories of Copernicus. Copernicus's theory is the foundation for physics that we continue to use every day. We owe our world to this man, Nicholas Copernicus.